Welcome back to the world's most popular podcast about creative people who make things that might not have anything to do with woodworking. Inexplicably, I call this podcast the Woodworking Talk Show. It's an, it's an elevated concept. My name is Steve Ramsey, and I created a YouTube channel called Woodworking for Mere Mortals 14 years ago. Over the years, I've made lots of YouTube friends in the maker slash DIY space who I get to catch up with on this show, and I continue to get to know new friends to introduce to you. By the way, I wanted to mention, I'll just mention it here first, that I finally started a TikTok all kinds of useful and informative video content. So if that's your jam, look me up over there. Just search for Steve Ramsey. You'll you'll find me. Blake, do you have a do you use TikTok at all? I have one just to reserve the name, but I I don't. I really should try and get on there, but I haven't yet. The the only reason I started it, and this is kind of dumb, is because somebody had my videos and was re-uploading them as me using my name and everything on there and they had like you know all these followers and i'm like well, how is that that's not fair so i contacted tiktok and it took like three months and eventually they got this guy out of there and so i thought well i might as well post some videos so i went from by posting eight videos on there i went from like three people following me <laughs> one of them was my son to like twenty five thousand in just like a couple of weeks it's been insane i don't know i don't know if they have like fake followers over there or what because i haven't mentioned this to anybody i don't know how people are finding me over there but that's wild but that's pretty cool you you had a scammer uh give you a little a little head start to know that it works <laughs> he, he did i'm like well hell if this guy could get all these thousands of followers i think the real guy might be able to oh <laughs> uh, it was insane it's it's hard to keep up with all the social media sometimes but here we are again and now tiktok it's a new new thing who who knows where it will lead for sure Blake McFarland is an artist who specializes in mixed media sculptures using wood, steel, epoxy, foam, fiberglass, crayons, even ramen noodles. Since 2019, he's been filming these creations and showing the process on his YouTube channel, BM Sculptures. His highly detailed sculptures can take up to eight weeks to create for clients such as Hyundai, the Cleveland Cavaliers, Golden State Warriors, woohoo, Bay Area, and many more. His multiple collaborations with Goodyear has led him to create multiple shorts, not shorts, sports team mascot sculptures out of recycled tires. It seems to be a medium that he's especially skilled with. Before becoming a full time artist, Blake was a professional baseball player who spent eight years pitching for the Toronto Blue Jays. Recently, Blake was a contestant on the TV show Making It. I'm looking forward to learning more about that. And even more recently, just like a few weeks ago, he became a dad for the second time. <laughs> hey, Blake, congratulations on that and welcome to the show. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So what's the last few weeks been like? Has it just been a whirlwind for you now that you've got two? Just zero sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bad. No, it's great. He's um, my my daughter, who's two and a half, is just a, a a wild one running around, and he's just great. Like sleeps all day, and he's he's been great. So very fortunate. What is the What does your daughter think? Is she really excited about the whole thing? Super excited, and we were nervous because you know the second one or the first one is always you think is going to get super jealous and everything. You don't know how they're going to react, but she's been great, and we are. Just really happy with how she's been handling it. Oh, that's great. And his name is Miles? Miles, yeah. And then my daughter's wow. Harper. And that, it's, it's been less than a month, right, since, since he, he was born? I think it's actually, today might be exactly one month. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's crazy. And, and here you are doing a by. podcast <laughs> <laughs> and working. You're still putting out videos and everything. Yeah, it's like yeah, for sure. No rest for you. So... <laughs> Uh, I was reading in your bio. It sounds like you were from San Jose originally, huh? Yep. Born and raised in San Jose. I went to San Jose State. Uh, my family, my wife's family, all my friends are still in the Bay Area. So I'm there all oh, the nice. time. Oh, that's great. Wow. But that 
you've seen a lot of changes in the Bay Area since you were a kid, especially sure. down there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're you're in Marin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So same. I mean, same with you, right? <laughs> yeah. It's just, I don't know. Prices of everything just keep going up, and <laughs> just when you think they're going to go down, they just they'll teeter for like a day and then shoot right back up even higher. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you guys were kind of smart. You move, you're out there in the Fresno area, right? Yeah, Clovis? Fresno area. We're here for, for at least my wife's finishing up her residency and then she's going to go into a fellowship. So we're here for sure um, for another two years. And then the idea is to go back to the Bay area, but hopefully like the Santa Cruz area, we both love the ocean and, and that area, but with these prices, who knows? I mean, yeah. Who knew, who really knows where we'll end up? I know it's kind of crazy because you see these like people from elsewhere in the country, you know, and they get like huge houses for, you know, 200,000 or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, wow, you can't get an apartment for that. <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I almost I almost moved to Fresno once. I actually accepted a job there. And I pulled out of it at the last second and I thought, you know, I can start my own business. And that's how I started back in 1997, my own graphic design that's business. awesome. <laughs> but I'm kind of glad. I was a little afraid to leave the Bay Area. I'm like, yeah. I don't know if I want to live down there. <laughs> Summers uh, are hot. Let's say that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so have you always been an athlete slash artist? It seems like, is that an unusual combination? <laughs> I, I don't usually think of athletes as being highly artistic people but you seem to have excelled at both of that of them of them were you like that as a child so sports was always kind of number one for me but i never really thought about it until later on but i was the kid in school always drawing i was always just doodling when you know when i should be doing work i was always drawing and and found out pretty quickly that i was pretty good at drawing and all of that and then In my downtime, you know, my dad had, my dad's kind of a handyman. So he had just all sorts of tools in the garage. Whenever I was bored, I would just make things when I was really little. So I didn't really consider myself artistic or anything. I was just bored and working with tools and making like bow and arrows and things around the house. Um, It wasn't until probably my sophomore, junior in high school that I picked up a set of paints, a paintbrush and actually did my first painting and then ended up selling that and really falling in love with painting and kind of the whole art scene. And how did you get into professional sports? Is that something that didn't kind of occur to you in college? It was my dream. I mean, I, th- I think I have a letter when I was in elementary school that I want to be a professional baseball player. And I think my mom has it framed somewhere, but since day one, I wanted to play professional baseball and I gave everything to the sport. Um, I played f- also football. I played football in college, in uh, junior college, as well as baseball. So that was kind of the big thing, deciding do I want to go football or baseball? But, you know, I always had that dream of being baseball. So I went to San Jose State and then was fortunate enough to get drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays. And then I ended up playing eight seasons with them. So it was nice. Fun. Did you watch the 49ers game last night? I did. (laughs) (laughs) Great game. I mean, both the games were really good. Yeah. uh, Unfortunate for us Bay Area fans. Right. You know what's crazy, though, is L.A., they don't have that fan base, I think, that you see elsewhere. And you could see it in this stadium, but it was like over half of the people there were 49er fans (laughs) in L.A. Yeah, it was fun. And and didn't, wasn't there like some kind of, scandal where they were trying to keep Niners fans from from going to the game. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. I would be kind of embarrassed if I was the owner of the Rams. I, you know, it's kind of the Chargers the same way, though. They just it's, they, LA is never really, and except for that two period where the Raiders were there, I don't think that they've really had a huge fan base. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see the Bengals in the Super Bowl. That's yeah. kind of cool in a way. It will be cool. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So what in the world inspired you to post a video on YouTube? So you've been doing this for a couple of years now. You started in 2019. It looks like your first video was a painting you did. Yeah, so I actually have to take it back kind of before this channel. I used to love just editing videos and making videos. Even in high school, I would have my friends and we would make videos and I would do all the editing. Um, It wasn't until probably six or seven years ago I had my own just 
my name, like a private YouTube channel. And it was literally just to store videos because I, at that time I didn't know how to store them. I was like, Oh, I'll just upload them and then I'll have them forever. So I did that and I put them on this, my own personal channel. And I had all these viral media companies reach out. Hey, we love this. We want to use it. And back then I'm like, sure, take it, take everything you want. <laughs> and so I saw probably two months later, I saw one of my videos circulating on one of these viral sites and it had like 28 million views. And I'm like, oh, that's soul minute. crushing. <laughs> Wait a minute. What was the, what was the video? It was uh, a tire sculpture. It mm. was one of the, uh, my first tire sculptures working with, with Goodyear for the cotton yeah. bowl. And they took that and hacked it up and then reposted on Facebook. And that really sparked my, my desire. I'm like, wait a minute, if they're getting this amount of views, maybe I should just try this on my own and then just start saying no to everybody. So that's kind of how I started my own channel. And my first five or six videos are actually just my really old videos that I just threw on there um, all at the same time. Um, and then from there, over the past couple of years, I've been more regularly uploading. Oh, so you sort of got inspired to post there the same way I started posting to TikTok last week. <laughs> Somebody else kind of pushed you over that edge. Uh, <laughs> it's actually, yeah, it is actually pretty much the same scenario. Yeah. What's your YouTube experience been like so far? Are you enjoying it? For sure. I just, it's, it's addicting. It's weird to say, but it's addicting publishing a video. It's like you're gambling, right? It's like <laughs> this, this could do really, really well, or it could do nothing. Like it's, it's a rush and a gamble, but also I just love making things and filming it and doing the whole process. Yeah. Although I've, I've not enjoyed editing as much. Oh, but, really? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's, it's fun. It's been a really good experience so far. Yeah, and you never know what's gonna what's gonna hit, and that's one of, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the show now is before you became a big shot because it was only recently <laughs> that you posted the uh, Swan video, and it was like last month or two months mm -hmm. ago. Uh, we carved a swan out of wood and epoxy, and man, that thing just kind of exploded, didn't it? You had like almost what four and a half million views on that thing yeah that thing went crazy and again like just unexpected you don't know i definitely don't know what video is going to take off and not and that one just immediately kind of went off and and yeah what was your reaction like when you started seeing those numbers going up I'm, at first i'm just like like what's going on is someone else <laughs> reposting this i thought i thought there was something else like s some other person promoting it or something and then it was just i kind of looked into the analytics and it was just getting uh recommended a lot more and and just kind of organically through the algorithm got more exposure so it was a really cool experience and i think that it, we should really I should really state to listeners of this podcast, if they haven't seen your sculptures, just how to understand kind of the scope and the size of these things that you carve. They're just stunningly beautiful. And when I say wood and epoxy swan, it doesn't do it justice when you see that thing. It's like a couple feet, three feet, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Long. And it's got what is it like like chunks of wood in there, right? It's how, how do you describe that just process? The swan is actually buckeye burl. It's a huge chunk of Buckeye Burl. One of the, the first time I've ever worked with, with Buckeye. And I got to say, it's the most beautiful wood I've ever seen. Have you ever seen or worked with Buckeye? No, I haven't. Yeah, it does look gorgeous. It just there. has all these different color variations in it and little pockets. And it's just really cool to work with. And on top of that Burl, massive Burl, I poured 13 gallons of epoxy over the course of like two weeks to, to make, do layers to make sure you know, the bubbles don't form and the cracking of the reaction and all that. So it's a big piece, but uh, really, really fun to do. And you know what makes that is the beak. You decided to make the beak out of, or I guess a bill. It would be a bill on a, a bill, swan. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, you made that out of out of wood. And so it really pops because then the head kind of stands out. You know, if it had all been epoxy, it would have had a whole different look to it. Yeah, definitely. And that was uh, an idea I had from the get go, but I didn't know if it was going to work. And I had a ton of people comment like, oh, I, I thought you messed it up or like you must have messed it up and then put that on. But um, it was it was an idea I had from the very start. Just I didn't know if it would end up working or not. And luckily it did. 
Was that a commission piece or was that just for your own? It was a commission piece. Most of um, the larger scale kind of sculptures like this are commissioned mm -hmm. because if it weren't, it, I would be in the hole a lot of yeah. money. <laughs> the time and money. I mean, yeah. wow, it takes a lot of time to make these projects. I know I saw on Instagram, you're working on a humpback whale right now, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you're, you're taking, how do, how do you describe that? Pieces of wood, gluing those together and then epoxying it. Yeah, just ta I'm taking a bunch of, uh, they're pretty much three quarter inch by three quarter inch slats of wood. And I'm just gluing all of those up in kind of different lengths. So it kind of looks like it's almost pixelized and, or like and different tasty. species, different species of wood too. Yeah. That's, yeah. And then so like right billions on, of them, billions of these. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you there's a lot. It, wow. I, I'm kind of regretting how thin I cut these because it's it was <laughs> two weeks straight of gluing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what do you do do you just like put on some earphones and just listen to tunes and just i listen to this podcast yeah <laughs> well i was gonna i was gonna suggest that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, how long do you spend like per session of just gluing those pieces of wood together so it's really comes down to how many clamps i have because oh right um yeah. I'll, I'll run out of clamp i mean i have a good amount of clamps but um I mean, I'm doing hundreds of glue ups, so then it's just a waiting game. I'll do, you know, 15 glue ups at a time, and then I'll just have to wait for them to dry, and then I'll have to mill them and then glue them up more. So it's just a whole lot of gluing up and milling and flattening and, and all that good stuff. Wow. It's fun to watch that. It's going to be f even more fun to see it take shape because I can sort of see now at what stage it's in, but... This is also one of those projects that's probably going to take a couple of weeks, right, to finish this thing? Definitely. It's already been two weeks, and I expect it probably be another week of pouring and then another two weeks of, of carving and finishing. So it, it, this one's going to be a long one for sure. So is that your is that your bread and butter, these commission pieces that you're selling to companies who request them? Definitely. Right now, it's I kind of only do commissioned work, and then if I – and down like if I have downtime in between commissioned sculptures, that's when I'll I'll do kind of these different videos. I'll do little restoration videos or or mix in other ones. But really my my business is all commissioned larger scale sculptures. Yeah. Wow. I don't know what they're paying you, but it's not enough for those, whatever it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> Your sculptures are uh, the swan, it looks like I would walk into a boutique gallery in San Francisco and I could see that on display there. It's that beautiful. It's just it's stunning. Thank you so much. Do you think that there's anything that you've, are there any lessons that you've learned over your years playing baseball? Do you think that kind of translate to the art world or are those two separate parts of your brain that just don't come together? No, I think they do. I mean, number one, it's kind of an easy one. It's just hard work. Hard work pays off. And that's that's within sports and within art and carving and making things. But also, uh, I was a pitcher. So when you are pitching, it is literally just you versus that hitter. And there's nothing. You are focusing on absolutely nothing but the task at hand. And I get that exact same feeling when I'm actually carving. I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm literally just thinking about okay, I'm going to take a little off here. How does this look? It's, I guess, kind of like being, I mean, it sounds stupid, but kind of like being in the zone when you're pitching. Again. Sure. You're thinking of nothing but the task at hand. And it, it, that's exactly what I think about while carving. What are some of the tools of the trade carving? Uh, I use the angle grinder a lot. Um, you, you can do so many different, you know, cutting heads on that, that, that you can do a lot with that. And then when I start, I'll actually use a chainsaw just to get the bulk off. Um, if it's a smaller piece, you could throw it through the bandsaw, but, but really it's, it's been chainsaw angle grinder and then the die grinder, but pretty much any power, any woodworking power tool can be used. And, and that's kind of what I, what I stick to. And do you, you know, you always hear this thing where they'll say, well, the artist sees the shape inside the block of wood. And it's just a matter of removing everything that isn't that shape. Is that, is that your philosophy? Do you, did you kind of see it in there before you carve? So I think people think that carving something is a lot harder than it actually is. So if you start with a perfect profile reference picture, it's as simple as putting that picture up on a flat surface 
And then you literally just, you're carving to the line. So you do that on the profile view and then the front or back view. And once you make those two cuts, you already have a rough shape. So it, it's really not as hard as people think. They think, well, maybe some artists do just see it in the wood and they just carve with no reference lines, but I definitely use templates. I use reference lines. I will redraw them on there and I will always cut to a line and then refine after that. Um, and that's kind of my process. Are there some fundamentals if somebody was interested in learning carving? Is it even something that can it can be taught, or is that such an artistic thing that it, there's it's just you on your own? No, it could hundred percent be taught, and that's how I learned. I literally learned on YouTube. I searched hmm. tons of different sculptors on YouTube, and that's how I learned. And that's how I learned about those two different profile views. Again, if you get two perfect pictures, you can make a sculpture a lot easier than you would think. Most of your sculptures are large sculptures. Do you ever do anything small scale? Um, I know she did like a, you did a uh, walrus, I think. I did a, a wall. Kitchen. Yeah, it was yeah. for um, uh, the builder, the builder's challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I did a walrus for that. Um, I, I'm i planning on doing some smaller scale stuff. And what I really want to do is the big cutoffs of these bigger sculptures. I want to take mm -hmm. those cutoffs and make smaller sculptures with that. So basically nothing goes to waste. Um, and I, I think that would be really cool, but I haven't yet, but I do plan on making some smaller scale stuff. Do you ever see these, these rice sculptures, these guys carve things out of a grain of rice or something? That's crazy. I do not know how they do it or the, uh, the pencil, the, yeah, the pencil, pencil. That's crazy. <laughs> they need like a mag or a, yeah, a, a magnifying glass just to see what they're doing. Yeah, you won't be using the angle grinder on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. So what's a, so how did you come about this relationship with Goodyear? It looks like you've been working with them for a while now. You've done a lot of sculptures for them. Yeah, um, about this was my fifth year. I did I did it this year as well. So this is my fifth year, and it, it originally started just a random email through my website from a marketing company. And saying that Goodyear was interested in hiring me for uh, the Cotton Bowl. And it kind of started from there. So my first year was really a trial run. Uh, Goodyear and everyone involved loved those first couple sculptures. And that was actually the video that went viral on those other sites. Um, so then they just kept, I don't know why, but they kept bringing me back. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a good relationship so far. So what you're doing is you're doing this, the, the mascots of the two teams playing in the Cotton Bowl, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's using recycled tires um, in a way I've never seen used before. Can you, can you take us through that process of how you're sculpting with tires? Yeah, so I guess I'll bring you back to kind of how it started. And I knew, like, so for my baseball off season, I have six months to do what I want. Most people, uh, give baseball lessons during the off season, but I knew, you know, I have six months of straight baseball. I want to go away from baseball and do something else. So I started painting and selling my paintings. So I quickly realized I wasn't a good enough painter to make any kind of living or off season job selling these paintings. So I knew I needed to go way off the grid. And that's when I kind of stumbled upon, Hey, tires are kind of disposed everywhere. What if I could do something with that? So my first sculpture was actually just experimenting with how can I attach these tires to a form? How can I maneuver them all around? And it took me probably two months to do my first sculpture. And now I've kind of um, sped up the process. So what I'll do now is I'll use pink insulation foam, your, your standard big box store insulation foam. I'll laminate all those sheets together to have a huge block. And then I will carve the whole sculpture out of that foam. And then from there, it'll go, I'll weld armature in there to give it support. And so I can attach it and, and stand on the base. And then that'll go into fiberglassing. And then the fiberglassing is going to give me the strength to put in screws and nails to secure all those hundreds and hundreds of tires. So it's really two sculptures in one. It's the foam carving, and then it's wrapping and attaching all the tires around that form. So when you're working with Goodyear, do they just like send you a bunch of tires or are you on your own finding the tires and, and all that? 
So that's all Goodyear tires. So that's one of the things that they, they definitely wanted in there. And those are all Goodyear tires for all my other sculptures. They're all recycled tires that I'll just go to local bike shops and they'll have piles of them because they actually have to pay to throw away tires. So they love it when I come and just take yeah. 20 tires off them. So it's, it's a good, good deal. Is it hard to, if you take a Goodyear tire, are these tires for cars? The ones Goodyear send you? Yeah, yeah. So are they hard to cut up? It looks like with, uh, I mean, I'm sure that they're like steel belted and all that, right? So how do you have to get around so, that? Yeah, so some of them are car tires. A lot of them are bike tires. And those are the ones that I can cut and weave. But it is um, part of the deal that I need to incorporate car tires on those sculptures specifically. For all my other sculptures, I will strictly use bicycle tires. And those I can cut with just... Uh, like in really good scissors. It's crazy watching you cut those things. I mean, your hand must just be just shredded it's, at the end of that. It's wiped out after the <laughs> day's work, like wiped out. Oh, man. So you, and you know what surprises me is it looks like you screw all of these pieces in. You don't glue any of the pieces onto the fiberglass, do you? No, because nothing that I know of sticks to rubber. Like nothing. Hmm. I've tried so many different products and I always, if there's a new glue out there, I will try it. And so far I've found absolutely nothing that, that it sticks to tires. Huh. And so then you, you, so you take all these various shapes and sizes, strips of rubber, you screw them in place to the fiberglass and then you paint them, right? Is it just regular like acrylic paint or something? Yeah, so it depends on, on the project. Sometimes I will pre-paint them and then attach them, and then I'll have, you know, touch-up work to do. On other parts, if I have a big section of one color, I'll actually tape it off and then spray it. And I just use exterior house-grade paint, acrylic paint, and it, it sticks pretty well. Again, it, nothing sticks really well to tires. So, you know, five, ten years from now, I do expect chipping. Um, but that's something we kind of talk about and, and everyone involved knows that. I, I do like to stick to just natural black tires, but when I have to, we'll, we'll paint them that way. Well, I would imagine most of those sculptures are are being displayed indoors and probably behind a, a rope or something. Or, or can people just go up and like touch so, them? So um, for those games, there people can actually go up and touch them, which oh. I don't really like. But <laughs> that's, then, that's kind of... <laughs> Man, hey, stop. Don't pick yeah, at that. Know, That's right? my tires on there. You have a microphone. <laughs> Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. <laughs> uh, but Goodyear will actually donate those sculptures to the schools after the game, and then it's kind of up to them to place them where they want. So I, I don't really know. <laughs> That's got to be super satisfying, though, to see your work on display at the Cotton Bowl like that. It's it's really cool. It's just a great experience, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that Goodyear reached out to me. For sure. Do you get to go to the Cotton Bowl? I did for the first two years, and I think that was just them figuring out how to like unbox, uncrate them, and and how they work and are set up. But I think once they kind of figured out that that's pretty straightforward, they didn't need to send me. So I haven't been the last three years. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you need to get a you need to get a gig worked out with the Super Bowl next. You know? I know, <laughs> right? get the free tickets <laughs> there. <laughs> The other thing you do on your channel, which is interesting, is you do a fair amount of tool restorations. And I think those are some of the most satisfying videos on YouTube to watch. Those usually perform really well. You'll take like an old $5 ax and just transform it. It's it's beautiful to watch. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love doing it. It's uh, kind of like you said, I, I've watched and I'm inspired by other videos of, of restorations. And that's kind of where I want to go with that. Yeah, it's it's soothing to watch. So you're doing those probably in between the sculptures, kind of just for your own. Yeah, I, I yeah. really like um, metal etching. And, and it's something that I haven't really seen much of, but I just love it. It's, it's super easy to do. You can literally metal etch any kind of steel really, really easily. And not a lot of people know about it or do it. So I kind of do a lot of my restorations slash modifications with, with metal etching as well. Yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I know you, you did that on the battle axe. And I don't know if I've seen that before. I, I saw you dipping it in there. You put the little, I don't know, you can describe the process. But then all of a sudden you hooked it up to electricity. I'm like, oh, this is getting serious here. <laughs> so how does this whole process work of electro etching? 
So I'm probably not the best guy to go into the science about it, but I'll tell you quickly how it's done. Um, you just take your metal that you want etched. You need to mask off the part that you don't watch want etched with just vinyl sticker, any vinyl sticker. Um, so you have your design, you cut it with your vinyl or you can so you would use like a, cr like a cry cut. Is they say cry cut or cricket? Is that I how you say I think it's it? cricket, but it might cricket. be circuit. Is it, I don't know. <laughs> I always mix it up. Yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, I have one of those. So I'll just, I'll have a design in there. It'll, it'll cut up and then I'll just stick that on the metal. You put salt in water or, or, uh, not baking soda, but I just use salt. Um, and then you hook it up to a battery pack and it will eat away. The, the exposed metal. It's it's really cool, but I have to say, if you do this, you have to wear a full respirator um, because the gas that comes off this is toxic. Um, so you have to do it outside, ventilated area, and wear the proper safety equipment. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know the science behind it. I just know how to do it. <laughs> how long do you have to let it sit in that bucket? Um, it depends how deep you want the etch. I will do it anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on what depth. And then obviously what voltage you have will also play into that as well. So mm. I think I have mine on around nine amps um, for half an hour to an hour. Is that dangerous? I mean, other than breathing it, um, like you stuck your hand in that water, are you getting zapped? Yeah, I yeah, that's that's why I don't want to I don't want to encourage anyone to do this without first, you know, researching this thoroughly, not from me, from a professional, but yeah, I I'll always unplug the battery charger, never touch yeah. the water, wear the proper equipment, gloves. Um don't throw a toaster in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of course you got an axe you're dealing with too. So you know, <laughs> don't play with that too much. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But you did the handle and everything on that. So it was kind of a again, mixed media kind of work. Yeah, I love working with wood and metal. It's it's yeah. really rewarding for me. Are there any any mediums that you would like to try that you haven't given a shot at yet? I watch so many forging videos. I, I think that would be so fun to do, but in in my little garage shop there's no way i can do it here there's no way i can mm -hmm. have one but i'm always just enamored with with watching forging in the process i think that's really really cool and what about materials for carving with anything that strikes your fancy you haven't tried um i mean i'm just falling more and more in love with wood honestly mm -hmm. like uh, that sounds kind of weird but um <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say your wood you said yeah. wood <laughs> But, um, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a woodworker, but I am falling in love with woodworking and just getting more involved with uh, different species of wood and, and sculpting and carving with that. So definitely just just more more woodwork for sure. What's a good beginner material to work with? Like clay, I guess. <laughs> would, it, would it be like low, <laughs> low risk kind of thing there, right? Yeah, it, it's a different process. So there's, there's two types of sculpting. There's takeaway sculpting, which I do. You start with a bigger piece and you take material away or you have your, I guess I'm going to say it is probably a proper term, but I'm going to say build up process, which is like clay. You're actually building it up. Um, so clay is probably easier. Um, but then if, if you want to do the takeaway process, you know, foam is actually really easy material to work with. And then if you want to get into wood, your soft woods um, are, are really good to carve with and kind of learn with. Do you use uh, carving chisels on the wood? Some people do. I don't. Um, I kind of just use power tools. It's just more efficient for me. Um, and plus your, your pieces are big enough too. Yeah. That kind of hard right. to use I would have to use that. But if it was a small piece, I would, I would actually lean toward, towards hand tools. So that would be really re rewarding. Hmm. Interesting. And what, uh, Hey, what's this deal about the TV show, the <laughs> making it, what was that like? Did, what, was that just a crazy experience or what? Plus you had to do it during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was such a good experience just to meet all the other makers. And I got to meet Jimmy DiResta there, which is yeah. awesome. Um, and then Nick and Amy, and they are they are better than you could think of on, like on camera and behind the scenes. You never really know what someone's going to gonna be like for real with, that you see you know, on TV all the time. And, and they were just 
awesome. Like really, really cool down to earth people. Um, and then to see like the coolest thing for me was to see the production behind this. Like, like you never expect a, a show like this to have so much production. And that was really cool for me to see just all the different cameras and angles and things they do. And, and I learned a ton from just watching that. So it was a really, really good experience for me. So did you just get contacted out of the blue to be a contestant on this show? Yeah, I had just randomly a, a producer kind of reach out and say, hey, uh, I think you'd be good on this show. Why don't you apply? And I was like, sure, why not? I, I've seen it. I've, I've actually watched the first two seasons before they reached out. And I'm like, yeah, that would that would be awesome. So then um, after that, it was actually a, a bit of a process. It was like a three or four month process of different interviews, hmm. calls, and all that. It, it was a process for sure uh, to get on. Um, uh, but I was very fortunate that they picked me and, and I was able to, to be on the show. Probably. A, it's, is it like a lot of these reality shows where a lot of what they're looking for is, yes, your skills and everything, but they're also looking for that personality and the, the look of the person who can be on the show. Definitely. And then obviously like the backstories and, and they, they love stories, right? Yeah. Storytelling uh, for sure. Yeah. And how did you do on that show? Um, I did all right. I, I think I made it like halfway, the halfway yeah. point. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of things not in my genre, really. But it was just a really, really fun experience to try different things and, and really kind of put myself out there. So how does that work? What do they do? I haven't seen the show. I, I, I'll confess. Okay, <laughs> no, no, no worries. I'll give but, you well, how does it work? Do they they give you each week? They give all the contestants like this is a theme project or something. You have to just exactly make it. like here. Like for example, here's a closet. Transform a closet into a loved one's happy place. Oh so wow! It's, it's you're like, like I that. carve things. <laughs> yeah, no. So there's there's no there's nothing like everything. A lot of it was was kind of interior, um, not decorating, but you're building things for the interior. Yeah. Um, I did do one tire sculpture on there, so that was that was good that I got to do that. But yeah, it was an elimination contest. Basically, they give you a uh, parameters, and you do that, and then that goes into judging, and then do eliminations and all of that. Is the judging is it kind of nerve wracking when they judge your your work? For sure, because you you know you're standing there, and then you have you know, just uh, judges like knocking your stuff <laughs> right in front of everybody, right? It's it's for sure. Like it's it's nervous. Who are the judges? Is it Amy Poehler and, and Nick? No, Oppenheim? they're they're just the hosts. Um, oh, okay. So they'll 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 be there for the judging. The the judges yeah. were um, in in Etsy. Um, I forgot her title, but um, it was Simon Dunin, and then. Mm. Um, why am I blanking on the name? Uh, Dana, Dana Johnson. And they were, um, one of them is a, uh, artist designer and the other is high up in Etsy and, uh, works with a lot of Etsy things. Were they brutal? <laughs> I think they have to be right. I mean, they, <laughs> on, no, they judging has got to be one of the hardest jobs, honestly, yeah. because everybody's stuff was good. They have to say things right for, for TV and, and also, you know, they're, they're super awesome down to earth. Yeah. Nice, nice people. But at least they didn't bring on like Gordon Ramsay as a guest judge or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, not, nothing like that. It's, it's a very easygoing show and, um, yeah, it's, it, it was fun. You think you would do that again if, if a, a situation arose? It's kind I of don't a show. <laughs> That's a tough yeah. question. I mean, it was a full month and a half you know away from the family we were in la that's really tough to do with at that time it was a, a one-year-old and to do it again that that would be tough to be away with from from two very young kids for that amount of time but uh, plus you had to be like experience. you had to be sequestered didn't you because of the covid restrictions we could not leave our hotel room we had all our food delivered to our room couldn't leave but with that being said we were literally on the set and in the barn the entire day from like 6 a.m. to 10 at night. So mm -hmm. there wasn't much time anyways to be outside the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. So what, what did your wife think about being married to an artist? <laughs> it's funny because she's probably, and she wouldn't mind me saying this, she knows it. She's the most uh, 
least artistic <laughs> people out there. But um, she, you know, she gives me full support. Uh, she loves what I do. And, uh, you know, it, it's been great. She's very, very supportive. Yeah. Is there any dream project you would like to take on? Um, I really want to do a, like a public sculpture. So they'll have kind of like public sculpture offerings. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, mm -hmm. um, if they build a new building in a city, there's a certain amount of funds that have to go to public art. So I really want to get into one of these, uh, public art offerings where I could do a, just a massive sculpture, uh, to represent a city or something like that. That's something I, I really want to get into. Oh yeah. There's lots of the San Francisco has tons of those kind of offerings. Mm -hmm. I remember when they were redoing the Embarcadero down there and they, one of the, one of the sculptures is this enormous bow and arrow. Have you seen that thing? It's I have. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. It's coming out of the grass, right? Yeah. 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 So but, cool. Yeah. It's always fun to walk around the city and find sculptures here and there and in front of businesses like to have them, but that would be really cool. Cause then you would be able to, everybody sees your work. That's super satisfying. I'm sure. Yeah. That would be, that would really be a dream. Yeah. So what are your plans with the YouTube channel? You just, are you, is your focus on content creation to some extent? So that's tough because you know, I'm still kind of fairly new to this. Um, and, and I'm just experimenting. I, I do different style videos every time I want it to become more of a thing, but right now I have to do commissioned pieces to, to make a living. So, um, I'm fortunate to, to be able to create cool commissioned pieces that I can put on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't really know. I'm definitely going to continue YouTube and definitely want to uh, grow the channel and, and do everything I can to make good content. Um, and I don't know where I'll be next year, but, uh, hopefully it's, it's making more videos and, and making cool stuff. Yeah. It's hard to keep posting content when you're the content you make just takes so much time to produce. I mean, especially now on YouTube wants everything, you know, keep cranking out the content. You're like, I'm working on something for three weeks. <laughs> I know I, I tried to do a weekly thing when I, when I had some downtime, but now there's no way. I mean, I, I can't be as consistent as I want just because one sculpture takes, you know, eight weeks. So it's, it, it's tough, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try. So if I wanted to give, give a shot carving something, my first project, would you recommend out of wood, would you recommend that I just get a chunk of wood, put a template on two sides of it, cut roughly to that, and then just shape it? Is that kind of basically what I'm looking at? Exactly. So I would, if I were you, I would get a chunk of basswood. Basswood is one of the easiest woods to carve. And then it's all about finding or drawing or sketching a perfectly proportioned profile view and then front view or back view. So then you cut the profile view, you're just cutting the lines on, I mean, you'd probably use your bandsaw for that. And then you piece it back together and then you cut the front view. When you do just those two cuts, you're going to have a rough shape of your design. And then it's all just kind of rounding the edges and you're going to see it just kind of come to life in front of you. Again, it's, it's not that hard. I know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you do it. <laughs> I don't know why it seems, it seems so intimidating to me. It's like, I don't know. There's something about that that seems like, that's like, oh, that's art. <laughs> I don't you can know. Do it. I, I, I have full faith that you it's can do this. It's between an art and a craft, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, building a table is one thing. <laughs> carving a swan. Have you ever have, had like a major mishap? Like, you know, you're carving a swan and the, the neck falls off. It, obviously, it didn't on yours. But you know, something like halfway through, you're like, oh, this is disastrous. So I did, uh, this is kind of crazy. I did a huge octopus tire sculpture and I've yeah. actually done two, but I did one probably five or six years ago, not my recent one. That was before I fiberglassed my, my foam forms. I used this um, like really hard plastic spray instead. So I'm lifting this thing up and it's probably got a six foot tentacle span. And the whole head just falls off. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was definitely a big mishap, but I just ended up gluing it back together and then 
it's all good. But um, yes, and then in the epoxy world, I've epoxy is such a tough material to kind of get the hang of. I have so many pieces with tons of cracks and fractures and bubbles from from not knowing how to do it properly. So definitely a huge learning curve uh, working with epoxy. Is epoxy easier or harder to carve than wood? It's actually it's so it it's harder, but it's hard to explain like like it machines really really well it's it's harder on your tools but it does sand super smooth and i i really enjoy the way it the way it carves in machines i mean it's a lot of people think it just ruins your tools but other than just doling them out a little bit quicker i i think it machines just like a, a very dense wood hmm you know what I found interesting was when you were carving with the the crayons. You were, you, and I, I liked that because you showed kind of the the trials and errors that you made along the way before you got to your final piece. But the carving just looked so satisfying because it's like it's like carving butter or something. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Luckily, on these bigger epoxy wood sculptures, I haven't had any catastrophic mistakes, but. Uh, uh, Fingers crossed on this on this next one. <laughs> wow, it's just it is really fun watching your videos. I hope everybody checks them out over at BM Sculptures on YouTube. Um, and I like that you're showing what you're doing over on Instagram too. So when the video finally comes out, I can feel like I was in on the process a little bit <laughs> as it works. But Blake, I want to thank you for joining me on this episode of the Woodworking Talk Show. And it's been a blast getting to know you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was, was really fun to do. Great to meet you. And thank you again for having me. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this podcast. I'll see you next time.